show that discusses internal and relational anxiety, how it blocks effective leadership, and how we can move through it to a greater health. And now your host, Steve Cuss. Katie Cole is the author of the outstanding book, Developing Female Leaders. Uh, we get into that book on this episode. And what really impressed me about Katie is how she was able to equip uh, any number of churches, no matter what your theological perspective on women and leadership is. She has a book that helps women and men ensure that they're developing the female leaders in their church. It's, it's a fantastic book, and we'll get into it here in the show. Katie served for over 16 years at Christ Fellowship Church, and while she was there, the church blew up from 3,500 to 23,000. Katie served in a number of roles, uh, her final role being the executive director of Multisite. She was over all of the campuses, and she also built a school of leadership to help people from within the congregation uh, find leadership opportunities in the church. Katie has a master's degree in human resource management. She's a certified life planner. She's uh, certified in the Myers-Briggs and also uh, the EQ360 emotional intelligence training. She's also certified with John Maxwell. So uh, Katie brings a lot of game to leadership. Um, And also the fact that she's a registered nurse. So she has an interesting perspective on leadership and life. I think you're going to love this interview. I began by asking Katie just to tell us about uh, what it's like to be a woman leader today versus maybe her mom's generation. I think for most women uh, like me, I'm in my middle 40s. My mom grew up in a completely different world. Uh, Her mom wasn't allowed to vote till she was an adult. Like women were not allowed to vote till the 1920s. My mom, I remember I was in, I think the second or third grade and my mom tried to apply for a credit card at Sears to get our car fixed and they wouldn't give her a credit card because she needed her husband or father to co-sign the application. So that's my mom who then raised me, you know, who's going to have a totally different experience coming of age in the eighties and nineties. But that's a rub between us. You know, she, it's not a negative rub, but she isn't quite sure how to support someone like me who wants to like write a book. She's like, well, you know, I think if a hundred people buy your book, that would really be something to be proud of. I'm like, well, that would mom, that would be something to be proud of. I'm hoping a few more people buy it, but she doesn't even, I think most of the time she doesn't even know what category to put me in. (laughs) And so it's going to be different a few generations from now, but I think most men have no idea what it's like to grow up without a a person of your gender ahead of you that you can look to as an example or ask a question of or imagine having their career. Very few of us as women, especially in ministry, have anyone we can look at and be like, I want to be like her one day. We're all wondering what's possible and how do I become like him one day, which is a kind of an awkward question and hard to get your head around. Well, and as I listen to what you're saying, Katie, um, what it makes me think of, I I think... um, the, the most difficult knowledge to have is blind spot knowledge. And that's knowledge that everyone around you has and you don't have. And then suddenly you have it. And as soon <laughs> as you have it, you feel exposed. And I think that is why this conversation can feel threatening to men. Cause it feels like women have known this for years and we, we uh, uh, suddenly, like I thought I was educated in the 1990s. I remember going through the theological debates in school and then, and then even leading our church when I came to our church and leading us through that and to, to discover in the last couple of years, oh, there's a whole amount of knowledge that other women have. I remember one of the pastors in our church, um, she's a good friend of mine. We've worked together a long time. And recently she gave me um, the, the list of everything a woman thinks in a dark situation, if she's walking down a dark path. And mm. then the, next to that is a list of everything a man thinks. And that there's nothing on the man, you know, the man's is blank. And the women's is this incredible depth of nuance of what will I do if, um, you know, I'm, I'm also in my mid forties. I've never given it that much thought. Like I know my wife is not always comfortable alone in those situations, but to be exposed to the inner life of a woman like that was really, really telling but you're nodding your head like, well, well yeah. I think, you know, safety is a huge factor for women in our everyday life. I think the Me Too movement has exposed how even in 
uh, places that should be safe, like your job or your church, that women are constantly on guard and on the lookout, not only for ourselves, but our children. And uh, that's an area for many families is an area of tension between husband and wife because she wants you to slow down or she doesn't want to have the, you know, camper parked here. And he's like, well, that's fine. Da, da, da. You know, so it, it plays out in interpersonal dynamics, but that those senses are really real. And women carry that into every aspect of their life, including their jobs. And so when we add these uh, sort of gender biases and norms into professional environments, women are already conditioned and primed to be fearful of risking something. And when they're already trying to, you know, any leader has an uphill battle growing in their leadership. It is hard for any leader, even in the most welcoming environments. But then you add these extra layers and many women don't know how to navigate it, don't feel like they should, and they haven't had a lot of role models to look to to see that it's even possible. And so it does create a lot of confusion. I think men would be surprised how much energy and brain capacity women spend trying to navigate all the extras and all the what ifs and uh, sort of the, it's not even insecurity as much as it is just navigating the emotions to gear up for taking on some of these things. Uh, um, so yeah, it's a very real issue. Let me let me ask you about that, Katie. Like you went from nursing, you went into church staffing, church leadership. You've you know you're a veteran at this at this point. You've had all levels of executive church leadership. Can you take us back to some of the earlier times when you started to become not just a church staff member but leading significant things? Could you put us in the room when you're the only woman in the room of church leaders? What is it like for you inside? Uh, give us a thought on what's it like as you're walking into the room and then what's it like as you notice, oh, here I am again, the only woman in the room. I think for me, um, this wasn't an area that I was very in tune with. I think that most of my development and what I've since learned from most women is that very few of us are thinking I'm the only woman in the room and I'm navigating female issues and none of these guys know what I'm dealing with. Like most of us are a little clueless to that. We're just trying to navigate the leadership opportunity God's given us. We want to be faithful in it. We want to lean into it. We know leadership is hard. We're trying to uh, find our way in it. And so for me, I remember, especially as I was sort of coming in, almost like coming of age into adult professionalism, as well as my leadership uh, levels were growing, I would walk into a room and it would be mostly men, but that wasn't the thing I was mostly thinking about. I was thinking, who does what? What's the agenda? How am I going to present my idea? And I rarely thought about it in terms of male and female. I thought of it mostly as Katie, the person who doesn't really know what she's doing. Katie, the person who's kind of like invited here by mistake. Katie, the person who is uh, probably going to be asked a question that I won't know how to handle. And all of these things that I took as very personal about me, my own inexperience, my own lack of ability, my own uh, just sort of an inability maybe to navigate these higher level leadership conversations. And so for me, I personalized it and internalized it a lot as my own uh, incompetence, I guess would be the word that I was constantly worried about and trying to uh, um, not leverage, but work against. Uh, I find out now that actually those are the kinds of things that most women struggle with. It's part of it was the gender element. Part of it was the way I was brought up into leadership. I was often uh, not involved in all the leadership conversations or invited to all the developmental opportunities. Yet here I am leading in a group of men who were a part of all of those things. And so it is a little bit um, at a disadvantage, but I was really kind of clueless to that. So in the research for the book, what I have started to uncover is um, this term that I really love, which is called the sticky floor. So most of us know kind of the glass ceiling. And in the church, we call it the stained glass ceiling, which I think is hilarious. Uh, but those are kind of the systems and structures, you know, that would keep a woman from elevating in leadership or being promoted. But the sticky floor are those things that many women experience internally that cause us to question ourselves or wonder if we really belong in a leadership room. And so the 
those are the things that now I look back and I think, gosh, I spent a lot of time and energy worrying or wondering how I was going to do when the reality was I was actually very qualified to be in that room. Oftentimes I look back now at those men that were so intimidating to me. I had a graduate degree that they didn't have. I had more experience in multi-site church than almost all of them in the room. I had led independently and in more innovative ways than most of them had. And yet when I walked in, my assumption was that I'm the one who knows the least. I'm probably the odd man out. I um, have the, the least amount of information to offer, the least amount of insight. And so that navigation, I think, is a common experience, but one that's hard to even know you're in until we start talking about it in contexts like this. Yeah. And I think you mentioned even when it comes to applying for an opportunity or a role, the natural inherent, it's a terrible, but the natural inherent confidence of a man versus the natural lack of confidence of a woman. There was, I think you, I don't remember the percentages off the top of my head, Katie, but you had a a set of percentages when you talked about that. Yes. For men, when they look at a job description, this is what the research says. Uh, when men look at a job description, if they feel 60% confident of what's required of the job, they'll apply, they figure they'll get it. They'll like, you know, figure it out on the way or call their dad or Google it. You know, they'll, they'll figure it out on the job. For a woman, when she looks at a job description, she needs to feel 100% confident of every aspect on the job description, or she won't even apply, which I think find so fascinating because it's not even that she's worried she won't get the job. She actually self-selects herself out of the job by not even applying and putting her name in the hat. So I feel like that has huge implications for us as church leaders, because it means even if we are in an environment that welcomes women into leadership roles, we can be advertising it and uh, recommending people apply. But most women who are qualified that we would want to take the job are self-selecting out and probably, to be honest, playing a gender card to help us stop asking her. So they're like, oh, I got so much on my plate or my kids, or I just don't feel like this is the right time, or I want to prioritize my family. And all of those are great reasons. But I've learned to push in on those conversations and really challenge women to not just think of this as adding more to her plate or to think of her calling as one calling at a time, but is there room to have a win-win? Is there a possibility that you could take on even a piece of this role? Or could we actually uh, help you get a assistance or help? Or is there a way to manage your kids differently? And I certainly don't have an agenda that every mom goes back to work full time. I'm not saying that, but I do want to lean into the conversation based on that information alone and at least have a secondary conversation with high capacity women that if I were to guess could probably organize and lead herself in a way that she could win at this job and still win in all of her priorities at home. Yeah, it's really, it's really good. Another thing I love that you did in the book is is how you addressed what's famously known as the Billy Graham rule, um, which obviously the Billy Graham rule is comprehensive. It's about money and accurate attendance, but the part as it relates to your work is male-female relationships in the workplace and appropriate and inappropriate behavior. Um, a couple of years ago, we re-examined the Billy Graham rule. I would confess that we had just adopted it uncritically. Uh, this was part of, I feel like, my own education. And it was interesting when the men and women started talking more about it, the women on our team were split. Some were very grateful for it. and But, but others were saying, uh, we want you to understand how we're not in the room. And that was the lesson we learned is the amount of lunches and coffees that I would informally grab with men that I wouldn't grab with women. And so our effort has been, we have, I don't know what it's called, but it's loose. It's like, instead of a hard and fast don't ever, it's more like, mm. don't be in the habit of, you know, if you were in the habit of, we felt like that was helpful. But what was most helpful for us is just to be extra mindful of these informal opportunities and how to open those up rather than shut them down, open them up to both genders. And you also mentioned groups you know, just, just this power instead of one-on-one, -on -one, you know, two or three or four people together. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us, tell us your take on all of that. Yeah. In the book, I kind of make a case that the Billy Graham rule, uh, is very helpful. I certainly have been, uh, 
recipient of its benefits because I've never been in a situation that uh, really put me in an awkward moment with any of my leaders. I didn't have any of those power plays ever pulled on me, which I'm very, very grateful for. That's not the case for the majority of women in ministry, to be quite honest. And uh, so I'm very grateful for those boundaries. However, I make a case that I don't think the Billy Graham rule really helps us long term in today's society. Because first of all, the Billy Graham isn't just a rule, isn't just about sexuality and inappropriate sexual behavior. It is about all these other things that Billy Graham wanted to have integrity about in his ministry so that they could be upstanding and trustworthy. I feel like if we could have adopted all of those, our ministries would be a lot healthier today than just about this one issue. Um, But secondly, I think uh, it's important for all of us to remember that as you get higher in leadership, it's less about skill set and it's more about your emotional intelligence and your ability to relate and connect with people because it gives you influence. And the higher you go in leadership, the more influence matters. Well, that influence is built through relationship. Trust is built through communication and connection and time and authenticity and vulnerability and all of those pieces that we use in any sort of relationship. So when we kind of um, draw a, a big, broad brush and say women cannot be meeting one-on-one with a man ever, that means that almost all of the higher level leaders in their church, she's never going to have an individual conversation with, which is where you would learn your senior pastor's real heartbeat behind why he's doing what he's doing. It would be where uh, a leader would learn her real heart's desire or passion area and what next promotion she would be most interested in taking. It's, It's where the nuances of the personal side of leadership get communicated. And so when we don't invite women into those, what we call informal networks, that's kind of the technical term, Uh, we invite them to the formal meeting, but not for the conversation afterwards or the lunch you had beforehand or um, all of those pieces. They really get left out of these critical conversations that allow you to elevate in higher levels of leadership. So I think what you're talking about, Steve, is exactly right. The first part of it is really being aware that there are uh, leadership contributions I'm making to some of my staff members that I'm not giving to other staff members. I am systematically discriminating against a percentage of who I oversee simply because I don't feel like I can go grab lunch with them, which is totally fine and appropriate. And I actually support any uh, practices of safety and purity. I want to support those. However, if that's all you do is just uh, acknowledge it and not ever change your behavior, then as a leader, you're really not including all the giftings and all the potential of all the leaders God's brought under your care and stewardship. And so simple practices like like you mentioned, what I suggest in the book is always taking two people to lunch. So why make it a one-on-one conversation? Just bring a second person. Even you taking two guys to lunch lets me as a woman know I could be in on that if I wanted to be, or if he asked me to be. When I watch you go off one-on-one, I automatically know I'll never have that with you. So simply changing your practice, even if you aren't quite ready to include women at those levels of leadership conversation, having the practices that change that. And by the way, Steve, I feel like it's important for most of our higher level male leaders, especially if you've been leading for a while, to realize you heading off with a young man from seminary is not necessarily above reproach in today's culture. It's it's just not as protective as you think it is. And so we have to be thinking more uh, globally. We have to be thinking about our LGBTQ culture. We have to be thinking about the fact that most people are interacting inappropriately online and through social media. It's not even happening at a restaurant (laughs) in some dark corner somewhere. So those practices, I feel like, although are helpful, are not really giving us the safety that most of us think they are. And uh, I think many churches are actually navigating that right now, that some of these practices didn't protect them from the uh, exposure and the sin that they thought that it was going to. That's right. That that's I, I love that. The Billy Graham rule cannot cure duplicity. Mm-hmm. You know, it, that's... and. The other thing I found, I, I enjoyed it, Katie, like when you mentioned the absurdity of two different, you know, taking two cars to the airport for a conference, but then being a thousand miles away in the same hotel <laughs> and just some of the absurdity that comes with the rigidity. Um, yeah. And then, I, you know, what was helpful for me was to hear from women and not just in my own staff, but nationwide, I think women are speaking up and saying, why are we painted in such a seductress? Mm. Like why are, why are men so fragile mm. that a man and a woman can't simply have a professional business relationship inside the church when they can have it 
in corporations all over the world. You know, like it is an odd, um, an odd assumption. So I really appreciated um, how you're dislodging it and disrupting it, and and also just provoking us to find a different way. I think if anyone, I think if there's ever a male leader who doesn't have to. Um, uh, worry or have so many protections, I would hope it would be the leaders in our churches. And that if someone really doesn't feel like they are spiritually or personally strong enough to have a one-on-one conversation with a female without it being a temptation, I would just pose that I think there's bigger issues going on that probably would disqualify them from leadership in your church <laughs> right. anyway. So again, I don't want to undo all of our protective practices because I think they're very important, but I do want to just uh, challenge us that if we have to be so protective, we're excluding 61% of our congregations from leading. We might want to look at this situation from a different angle. Yeah, I, I, right on. Okay. This next question I say with fear and trembling as a guy. <laughs> we um, welcome your hard questions, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Not hard for you. Hard for me to say. You write about the queen bee syndrome. Mm. I have not heard it uh, called that before, but I've experienced it. And uh, this is my question that I say fearfully because I know some of my team listen to this podcast. Um, I have found that in our staff culture, it can sometimes be much more difficult for women to work with women than it is for men and women to work together. And I think it's the queen bee syndrome you're talking about. Could you explain what it is first and then give us your thoughts on it? So the queen bee syndrome was coined um, based on some research quite a while ago that was looking at early female leaders in very male-dominated environments. And what ended up happening is that Uh, when one woman would sort of break through the glass ceiling and sort of rise to the top, everyone was a little surprised that she wasn't bringing droves of women with her. And uh, so there was kind of this, um, I don't know, I guess the other phrase was it would be sort of like a cat bite, you know, when women just get competitive and kind of like gossipy and manipulative, all the bad things that come with sort of the um, stereotype of a female gender role. And I would say probably that happened a lot. (laughs) I think I've experienced it. I think I've been tempted to have it, to be quite honest. And so it is a very real thing. However, the later research is really pointing to the fact that that's not a female issue. That is a conditioned response that happens whenever there is a scarcity of something for any minority. So if you put uh, a whole bunch of men together and there are a minority of some ethnic descent and there is one spot available for them, they will become competitive with each other. Um, These aren't usually advertised limitations. (laughs) They aren't things that we say, we have room for one female on the board of directors. But we all know when we look at it, that there uh, is resistance to females in leadership, or there at least isn't an overt attempt to get a certain percentage of women on the board, or whatever the leadership team is. And so we know that if there's one woman up there, there isn't room for two. And so that scarcity mentality does breed competitiveness, and rightly so. If there's a, you know, lack of food, I live in South Florida, we just went through a hurricane. If there's a lack of food, it gets competitive. Like Home Depot is rough. Uh, You know, right before a hurricane, that plywood becomes in demand. And so anytime there is that scarcity, it brings out the worst in us. The second factor is that many times a woman who actually has broken through the glass ceiling and is leading us at a high level, part of what we have to understand is that she has so many double shifts, double binds, double everything that she is navigating. Very few women at that level of leadership have the capacity to now also be responsible for all the women who will come after her. And for whatever reason, in most organizations, but especially in churches where we tend to relegate men's development to men and women's development to women, There is the assumption that if you are a female on staff, you are now in charge of all of the women who will grow in leadership. And it's your job to mentor them and teach them and have special women's leadership outings. And all of a sudden, the men have no responsibility for all those up and coming female leaders. So she's tired. She's got a big plate. She's probably doing a double shift at home. So she works a whole day at work and then she goes home and does the primary care for her children at home. Uh, She is navigating dynamics that most men are not having that to navigate. She does not have a pastor's wife at home making everything go well and packing her lunch for her in the morning and making sure her clothes are ironed. So this girl does not have a lot of extra to add, but there is a lot of pressure to do that. And so sometimes uh, for these women, it might be interpreted as unwilling to help other women or like a queen bee syndrome, but really she's doing a great job at her job and that should really be enough. Taking your 
vitamins, it's probably time for the <laughs> I'm the ready. <laughs> gauntlet of anxiety questions. I just love that you All call right. it that. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah, it's totally tongue in cheek, but it is. It can feel a bit invasive. Um, I've I've heard it once described as a combination of a roller coaster ride and a proctological <laughs> exam. So, you know, somewhere between those two. Um, let's start, Katie, with the physiology of anxiety. Um, I believe that anxiety gets a grip on us and oftentimes drags us down a path before we're even aware that we're anxious. And um, one of the best techniques to intervene is to notice it physiologically. So for you, um, if you had to choose between a spinning mind, a racing heart, and like a tightening gut, where does anxiety begin for you? I am 100% a spinning mind. I would say that my, uh, my personal inner thought life is probably my biggest barometer for how I'm doing emotionally, spiritually, even physically. It's a lead indicator for me of all sorts of other issues. And uh, for me is a foundational piece to just health and wellness uh, as a person, uh, but also a great indicator when something's not going right for me. Okay, great. Now, I think one of the great sources of anxiety for any leader is when you're in a situation and you don't know what to do, but because you're the leader, you have to do something. I think young leaders believe the lie that we all outgrow this. You know, like <laughs> one day we will actually know what to do. Would you be willing to give us a time where you didn't know what to do, but you had to do something? What What was that? Well, gosh, I feel like I have a million of these, including like yesterday. <laughs> so um, I do think as we grow as leaders that um, are what, what what stumped us two years ago is automatic and easy now, but we have a new thing that's stumping us. And so that's probably the way that I look at part of what I feel like helps me in my own kind of anxiety journey is remembering the thing that I wasn't good at two years ago and acknowledging that I've learned and grown. And it's actually kind of easy for me now. It gives me courage to take on where I'm stumped in my leadership now. And part of that for me is the faith journey of knowing that God's hand delivering me opportunities that aren't meant to stump me. They're actually meant to stretch me and grow me. So that growth mindset, I think, changes the dynamic. It feels more like an adventure with the Lord to figure out than it does something that's going to take me out of leadership or undo the work I've been work doing. Um, I, I can think of a, a particular situation. I won't give too many details, but um, I was a little bit in over my head in the leadership opportunity that had been given to me. And I was young in my leadership. I didn't know how to ask for help. I uh, kind of have grown up always with the assumption that everyone knew how to do these things. And I'm kind of the only person that's clueless. Like, for example, just to clue you into my personality a little bit, I remember... <laughs> <laughs> learning how to make macaroni and cheese when I was in college and just not knowing how to do it and realizing there were directions on the box. And I was like, you're kidding. I've been trying to figure this out like on my own. This was of course before Google, but I was just like, I had no idea there were instructions. And I think that's my approach. My default approach to most of leadership is that I should know how to do this. And so I just better figure it out rather than going, there's probably direction somewhere. Someone's probably done this once before. There are probably people who love me and want me to succeed, who would love to help me with this. And so um, those areas where I get stumped like that um, is usually because I don't know to ask for help. I don't want to feel vulnerable or expose the fact that I don't know what's going on. And so um, that's the example that I think of um, when I think of really being stumped and, and what I needed to do differently. That's great. Uh, one source of chronic anxiety for a leader is when we think we need something in any given moment that we don't actually need. So mm. back in my days as a trauma chaplain, believing the lie that I needed to know what to do and I needed the answer. Nowadays, um, I've battled this all my life, the need to be impressive or the need for someone to understand me. So if, if I'm in a meeting and I'm being misunderstood or particularly if my motives are being called into question, I get really anxious. Uh, are you able to name in, in this moment just one of the needs that you believe you need that you actually don't need? I definitely think I probably uh, constantly feel the need to have an answer that's different than anybody else. <laughs> a unique answer. A unique answer. Yeah. That my perspective or my take on things or my insight is a 
fresh voice or a different thing. And I think part of that is because one of my gifts is those kinds of things, bringing new light to topics that maybe have been looked at in a certain way. I think this book is like an example of that. But I think sometimes it's easy for me to take it to an extreme that I've got to have a unique answer to every situation that's coming up when really sometimes the standard one works really great. (laughs) Shoot. That's the worst. (laughs) Uh, That's great. That's a great answer. I've asked this question on, you know, we're about 30 guests into the show. I've never had that answer. I love that answer. So for you, the greatest compliment is something like, not since the time of Jesus have we heard such insight or something like that, right? Is that is that what it's like? I haven't gotten that yet, but I probably am secretly aspiring to it, yes. That's the home run, yeah. I oh, think, that's well, such a great I think answer. the creativity, you know, when you have, a, like for me, I love creativity. I love new and innovation. I, I love to think about the future and what could be. And so for me, I live in that space. So I want to hang out there most of the time. So, you know, like anything, I'm sure you've talked about this on your podcast, but, you know, our greatest strengths tend to be our greatest weaknesses. There's a shadow side to those things in a fallen world. And right. so right. Um, when when I get stuck or when I'm, you know, hitting my head against the same wall over and over, over again, I've learned to look at what is the strength that I'm misusing, that I'm walking outside of God's spirit. I'm trying to leverage it in my flesh. That's usually my best indication of where I've gone wrong. Well, and what I like about your answer too is um, you're driven, you're, you're conflicted by what is what does the situation require versus my requirement to make it unique. <laughs> I think most leaders could relate to that. That's really great. All right, let's try this one, Katie. Like this this podcast doesn't just focus on a leader's internal anxiety. We also equip people to notice anxiety in groups. And the theory is that um, people catch anxiety the way you catch a cold. It's always contagious. And without a non-anxious leader in the room, the most anxious person in the room always has the most power. And it doesn't mean that they're afraid or um, worrying. Sometimes anxiety looks like uh, raising your voice, interrupting somebody. Mansplaining, by the way, is always an anxious response. Mm. That's so good. I love I'm that sure insight. You Most ladies like the mansplaining part. Um, <laughs> and and if you'd like to know more about mansplaining, I'd be happy to tell you all about it. Just a little <laughs> attempt at humor there. Um, tell us about a time where you've seen anxiety be contagious in a group. Hmm. I think that, uh, especially in ministry settings, I've seen that anxiety happen when uh, we misuse the urgency of the gospel to motivate team members to kind of go above and beyond. And this is something I've started to really spend a lot of time contemplating um, because navigating emotions and creating energy and momentum around something is a huge part of the influence of a leader. But there is a tendency that I see now that I work with churches all over and do more consulting, I get kind of a broader view of the kingdom and sort of our leadership practices. And I do think that one um, epidemic that I'm starting to see is just the manipulation of anxiety for more output from staff members. And we tend to spiritualize it. Uh, with the urgency of the gospel, or people's souls are on the line, or Jesus could come back tomorrow. And even if we don't specifically say that, there's sort of this dig in and dig deep for right now, because now's all we have. And I think that spreads like wildfire in a group setting of people who care about the gospel, who love the Lord, who want to help lost people. And for me, I feel like it's a... um, contributing factor, a major contributing factor to the amount of burnout we're seeing in ministry leaders, because there is this drive, drive, drive mentality that really, if you were to put it in a marketplace environment, would be really criticized by most Christians as overworking, slave driving, more bricks, less hay, you know, all of that is what it looks like, but we spiritually justify it. And so I think when a leader uses that for people, or even a leader comes in with their own worry about not pleasing God enough or not doing enough for the Lord. And I bring that into my ministry leadership and I spread that to my team that none of us are doing enough. First of all, we're missing grace. We're not living out the actual gospel, but then we're 
killing our bodies and our emotions and our relationships for the sake of something that isn't actually spiritually fruitful. Does that make sense? I think that's an amazing answer. And uh, what I'm struggling with is uh, I think that's actually a unique answer. So I know you love to give unique answers. <laughs> you don't thoughts, want to affirm my... <laughs> I actually really do. I totally want to affirm it. I just don't want you to feel like I'm I'm playing because straight up, I think that's great, great wisdom. Uh, truly, that was great. Um, to to that end, then, Katie, um, my experience with leaders, and in, in my own case, this is true. Um, I tend to die on every hill. I don't steward my care well. And I think most leaders, we do this, we rush in, you know, and sometimes we shortchange people's experience by trying to relieve them of a burden. I would like to hear from you um, any thoughts you have on the difference between loving somebody by carrying a burden and loving somebody by walking alongside them. Both are appropriate, but my tendency is to always rush in and carry. Um, What's your take on that? I think that that? is a really... Great question and a great thing to think about um, because all of us sort of have a different driver of what causes us to lead and particularly causes us to help and minister and shepherd when we think about it more in terms of like the caring of people. I think part of what we have to do is really look at our own motivation of, is there something I'm getting from this where I could actually be manipulating the situation or even this person's needs to fill something in me that's not being filled where it should be, which is really in our wholeness and oneness and walk with the Lord. And so when I'm serving myself, even if it looks awesome and is greatly applauded by other people, and even if the person I'm serving is appreciative, if I'm doing it with the wrong heart, you know, gosh, Jesus does such an amazing job of calling out the heart to our actions more than our actions ourselves. So I think that's the first place to start. The second is when we come at things from a true servant perspective, where I really don't have an agenda for myself, uh, either Um, clear or even hidden. And I really am trying to help the person. I think part of what we have to make sure we do is think of the long-term God goal for the person. And that idea of caring too much or undoing someone's burden is such an easy thing to fall into because we're coming from a source of strength and we're coming from a place of ability and the ability to help. And if we don't see God's long-term vision for people and the situation, and really we get that through scripture because he's so clear on how he does work with people. If we don't have a God perspective in those moments, we feel like the goal is to relieve pain or the goal is to stop suffering. And sometimes it is, but sometimes, especially when it's more uh, growth-oriented pain or emotional suffering that is cluing someone into the fact that something's wrong, when we relieve that, we're actually stunting their growth and really stunting their sanctification. So I liked even what you said about coming along someone and carrying their burden. I think there's a sharing the load that is probably a better word picture of what that should look like, where there's an opportunity to say, I'm here in this with you, but this is your load, but I'm here with you. And I'll take a little extra. I can't carry it forever because it's not actually my load. Um, When we do that, I think we serve the people so much better because it's uh, allowing them to have enough pain that they actually connect with God on the things he's trying to teach them. I have been guilty um, of short-circuiting that development in all sorts of people. I do it as a ministry person where I want to alleviate someone's need. And so I go to the benevolence account or I sit down and negotiate the conflict between the two of them, thereby preventing them from either getting a job or following up on the tough conversation and stretching and growing into conflict. I'm the rescuer. I'm the savior. I'm taking God's place in that situation. I do it with my child. You know, moms are notorious for this. That's the reason they call us helicopter moms, but we swoop in and we do things for our kids. And so I work really hard not to do that, but it's difficult because at some point you used to do everything for this child and now he's 15 and I'm like, maybe I shouldn't do that part for you anymore. So It's really, but knowing what developmental level someone's at and withholding in a way that's loving for their good feels very much like how God 
disciplines and disciples us. I think of it in leadership development too. I probably short circuited many people in their development as a leader, because even in the meeting, I'm seeing it not going well. And rather than letting it crash and burn and making that person go back and fix it and apologize and set the record straight, I'll swoop in, recast the vision, reframe the dialogue and make us much more efficient. God is almost never in the business of efficiency. He's in the business of sanctification. And even though that's my propensity and I love things to be efficient. That's not actually what grows people. And so um, part of that, I think, is being enough in check with myself that, like I said, the motivations are right, but then I've got the right goal in mind, the God goal. Um, and that's the thing that takes priority. Yeah, fantastic. All right. Last question. Um, I think part of leadership, leadership anxiety comes from simple input, output, in balance, too much serving, not enough receiving, mm. too much a conduit of God's gifts, not enough a recipient of God's gifts. When leaders, when we think of God's gifts, we think, oh, I'm gifted to preach or lead rather than this is a gift that my father has given me as his beloved son or daughter. So to that end, um, when in your life, Katie, do you feel most fully loved? Mm. I would say I feel most fully loved when I feel that I am known and understood. I don't even think I need people to agree with me. I think I just really want to know that they understand where I'm coming from and what my perspective is and that uh, they get me. And I think that's the thing I love most about my walk with the Lord is of anybody, he gets me the most. <laughs> he made me, he crafted me. Yeah, yes. And seen. so that is such a powerful motivator. And I think even in this conversation about women in leadership, uh, part of the consistent complaint for women is that they don't feel like they're actually understood. Uh, some of the language we use about, even mm. about women are insecure in certain environments. It's really not insecurity. That's not, I don't ever feel insecure. I do often not feel invited to be bold. And holding back boldness is different than feeling insecure. And so even that nuance, I can tell you with a lot of clarity, the leaders, the male leaders who interpreted me as insecure and those who understood I was just not being bold as I normally would be if I felt more comfortable and welcome in the environment. And that changes everything in terms of how loved I feel by those leaders. Uh, very good. Katie, I, I had high hopes for this episode and it's been delightful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Steve. This has been a joy and I love the work you're doing. It's so important. And so I just appreciate you and your role in the kingdom. Thank you. This episode has been a production of Brendan Reed and Steve Cuss. 